about the Calvary, Calvary um, this coming Sunday, and Josh, Car Josh Corman is running that. And so he's just going to do a quick three-minute intro um, and try to get uh, more people involved in that particular program. Josh? a fire talks was back in 2009 um, so Michael San I'll just call cat catalyst and Nubix started it then uh, we basically just had it at the end of the hallway there and this was the inaugural version and, and Jack's looking down right now this is the this was the inaugural version of the sock puppet presentation <laughs> Does everybody remember this year? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we had some, some snowball fights, or should I say schmoballs. All right, so this year, I just wanted to give a big shout out to all the sponsors. So our platinum sponsor this year is Cobalt Strike uh, on Twitter, Armitage Hacker, and advancedpentest.com. So um, awesome pen test tool. Yeah, is, uh, is Raphael here? No. He's still selling his stuff, right? All right. So um, the gold sponsor was Tikras. So a friend of mine, if you know him, Jason Oliver, he started, uh, he's Native American, and he's, he started a small business lo locally to, to DC here. So uh, thanks, Jason. And CSR Group, it's a, a, a local veteran-owned company, so thanks to them. And then last but not least is Hacker Academy, the place to go for some awesome online training. I uh, also just wanted to give a big shout out to some of the volunteers. So we had a little CFP, so Jack and Jason helped with that uh, recording. We always have Iron Geek as usual. Uh, um, Jack also pulled together some of the judges for this year, and I, so I think Jack's gonna be a judge, we have Space Rogue, and who's the? Shannon. Shannon. Awesome, thank you for doing that. Uh, security, we have David over there, thank you to him, and then also Tess working security over there, and, actually, and speaker Wrangler, thanks to Stacy Banks. Um, so this is the schedule that we're gonna be going this year. I'm really not gonna spend too much time on this, um, but Mark's going to be up next, and without further ado, I'm going to try to switch presentations. That was my whole talk, thank you. <laughs> Security. Anybody see that? Yeah. All right. Should I do my own time or? No, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, okay. Sweet. All right, I'm gonna get started before he starts the clock, so we have a few. Oh no, Iron Geek says no. No one wants to see this talk ever again, so it doesn't. Audio, all that? It should be good. OK. All right, well, I want to get started. All right, well, thanks for having me. Um, fire talks are awesome, so I'm glad to be here tonight. Uh, before I kind of get rolling into the actual research part, uh, it was cool that Josh actually started talking about I'm the Cavalry, because I was going to do that anyways. Do it again. I am going to do it again. Uh, so I actually had an opportunity to write a Wired article uh, last two weeks ago. And I, it was, instead of talking about what's going to happen in 14, I decided to talk about what happened in 13 that was important that people might have missed. Uh, so my four stories were 
the TrendNet debacle where the FTC basically regulated the fuck out of them. Um, I talked about ZMAP. If you guys don't know about ZMAP, check it out. Uh, Barnaby Jack, who hopefully that means something to a lot of you guys in here. Uh, and then I'm the Calvary. Those are my four 2013 stories that you might have missed but, but definitely shouldn't have. So um, hopefully go see Josh's talk, because this talk and research I'm going to present at besides San Francisco are definitely very into what Josh is, what Josh is trying to help. All right. So uh, eyes on. Does anyone have an eyes on? What, was that a hand? No, that's just someone being very excited. OK. Uh, so the eyes on is basically just this very Apple-centric web camera, your I, you know, general IP camera. And I got one of these. I got one for my brother. Is this echoing really bad for just me or everyone? Good. All right, keep going. Um, so it's an iOS-specific thing, Wi-Fi enabled. Um, it does recordings. Like, so if you have a, a noise alert or a motion alert, it'll actually record like a 30-second sec segment and then put it in the cloud. And then you can view it remotely from wherever you are on Earth. Uh, so it's sold across the world, you know, Hong Kong, Europe, et cetera. And all your major retailers probably have one of these guys. So I was trying to find a Raspberry Pi on my network. And like any random person trying to find anything on their network, you end map the fuck out of your network and hope you find it. So uh, I didn't find my Raspberry Pi, funny enough, but I found something listening with Telnet. And any time, there's, there's, a, there's a rule that I'm sure you guys know, which is if Telnet's listening on your network past two, like 1999 maybe, you probably should find out why. So I did. Um, and it turned out to be the Izon. And this just led me on a whole really weird road down Izon hell. And I never found this Raspberry Pi still. <laughs> so this camera specifically is set up really easily for the consumer. You put in your uh, SSID, WPA, uh, you know, key and whatever, and it makes a QR code. And then you hold your camera up show the QR code from your iPhone, and it actually reads that in, goes to town. Uh, if you look really closely, it might be hard to read, I actually found a QR code that was kind of like a media kit thing, and it has an SSID and a uh, WPA key that says, we live Apple, and, the, and it says like STEM Office 136, which is the company who makes it. I'd bet if you go to Utah and drive around their campus, you might find that SSID, just a heads up, QR codes are not secure. So, so yeah. oh, just wait for this talk. So, uh, so this camera, like a lot of embedded devices, uses multicast DNS to like say, hey, I'm here, you should set me up and do something with this. Uh, so that's not, that's not all that surprising. What we do know is it's Linux based, it's an ARM you know, platform. Uh, so for, for the multicast part of this, not, not too interesting. However, the one thing that started me on this, you know, is this safe or not safe, or how, how well did they do security? Uh, I saw this RSA pub, oh, that's not good. I saw this RSA pub key go across the wire. I was like, oh, they're gonna do, you know, so, you know asymmetric crypto, this seems legit, probably not a big deal, this, this camera's probably great. That was the only part they encrypted for anything they do. So what they actually do that for is they actually encrypt uh, the admin password that's randomly generated on your phone, send it over the wire encrypted with this pub key back to where the private key lives on this camera, and then, you know, so you have this transfer of admin password created, admin, pa admin password uh, on the actual camera. Anytime you see Telnet or SSH or anything else running, you say, I want a shell. That should be your ho hopefully your first instinct. I want a shell on this thing. Uh, so we know the admin password was sent over the wire encrypted. So unless you want to brute force that 1024-bit RSA key, I wasn't going to. Um, all, the web all the web transactions that actually happened over the wire for APIs and other stuff was actually HTTP digest. Now, if you know HTTP digest, a lot of the values going over the wire are clear text. But the important part is the secret. Like any you know, important operation, the secret matters more than anything. So unless you're going to brute force the HTTP digest packet and actually suss out what the, what the key is in that case, you're not going to be able to create packets and send them over the wire on your own behalf. Funny, they use the updated version of HTTP digest, but they don't actually use the counter. 
So every packet that goes through the wire is vulnerable to replay attacks. So if you record one packet of streaming video, you can just replay that packet and you get streaming video again. Um, we could brute force Telnet, we could brute force ATP, HTTP Digest. Both are potentially slow depending on what the key is, so that's not a great idea. Um, and I'm not a big hardware guy, I'm starting to learn more and more about it, but you know, JTAGging this thing wasn't exactly my cup of tea, so I thought about other ways I could go about this. So I cracked the app. Um, if you have a jailbroken iPhone, it's extremely easy to use RAS to crack or clutch. You basically load, effectively what you're doing is you're loading the app up. In memory, this otherwise encrypted app is of course decrypted. You dump it out, take it out like GDB or something else, dump it, and then you have an unencrypted version of that same app. So once you have the app, um, and hopefully you should see crypt ID zero right there, you can look for strings, or you can run in an IDA, or anything else you want to do to look for fun stuff to attack. Uh, in my case, I hit like perfect pay dirt. They actually do firmware upgrades by connecting over Telnet and then echoing out a shell script. That is the process for managing firmware updates on this camera. So, as you might be able to see from this screenshot, hopefully, uh, they put the root user name and the root password literally just in the binary. So guess what, we have root. <laughs> um, so this is every single, I assure you, every single I got root on something screenshot ever, you name and uh, you know, um, ID and all that kind of stuff. And then of course a process list mapped to port, uh, port numbers. Because this company doesn't know what they're doing, everything on this operating system, this Linux you know, uh, variant, is all encrypted with Descrypt, which hasn't been okay since 1995. And using my MacBook, I was able to crack one of the passwords in like three seconds, and the other password in about 10. Um, and then my buddies at Akivant actually cracked the last one, which is the slash capital admin slash. So thanks, thanks to Akivant for that and Quine. Um, but what, what's more interesting at this point is you have the, you know, operating system level Telnet credentials, right, the Unix level credentials, but we also have a web app that's running on this thing. And that's actually how all the API operations are carried over from the app reaching out to the camera, going back and forth over just, you know, uh, HTTP calls. So the next question is, what are the credentials for that? Well, once you have access to the local operating system on the camera, we were able to just look for, look for files and see what we could see. And it turns out they actually have a Lua file that has config data. And in that config data, there's actually a user called user and a password called password. Um, and then that, cr that crazy super crypto RSA 1024 key, yeah, that encrypted the admin password that we actually have clear text on the camera. So now we know what's happening. The fun part is user user, as you guys won't be shocked, is actually on every single camera ever made. Really. So this is me logging into my camera uh, via what's called Mobileye. And Mobileye is actually a web, I guess web service if you really wanna trump it up, that is the core of how this whole camera works. So the, the mobile app on your phone is actually just communicating back and forth with a bunch of uh, CGI apps over HTTP calls. So there's an entire UI for this thing over HTTP, and once you have the user user login, you can log in, view the camera, hear the audio, check firmware details, and you can even find all the API keys for all the private accounts that all the video streaming and video uploads are used for. So without having any administrative access or cracking any data, you can actually access all the data you need to find all the recordings that have ever happened for this camera. So if you wanna log into a camera remotely and you're you know, a bad person, you, you could very well use Shodan, for instance, find Telnet listening with the banner for this Telnet port, and then you could decide to log in with user user and what you would see is you can actually run a, a Wi-Fi scan, and of course no one has ever had neighbors that named their Wi-Fi like their home address. So there's no way to narrow down where this person lives. Um, and then you can actually see, if you see that like little light section of boxes, those boxes are the part of, this, of the camera 
that are actually monitoring for motion. And while obviously we were able to kind of gank out the, uh, the Lua config for the admin password, if you log in as the admin, you can, from this user interface, disable all of the motion alerts. So you can find local Wi-Fi access points. You can obviously know the IP of this camera. And then you can turn off all the alerts for the camera. So in terms of thief enablement, this is a pretty powerful uh, product. Uh, and this screenshot is just like firmware details, uh, what it's running, Linux, ARM, all that kind of stuff. You can actually blink the LED if you want to troll someone and just go crazy. So there's that. And then the bottom screenshot, I know it's probably hard to see, is API details. And this is the third party service they're using to actually stream. So one of the third parties they're using is called Intellivision. And there's a little blurb they tell about themselves. Um, how many people use AWS S3? for anything, doesn't matter. Okay, enough people that this will be exciting. So they use one bucket for every customer, for every video upload, and then they hard-coded those, those uh, credentials for the S3 bucket inside the mobile app. <laughs> the files themselves, the files themselves are MD5 sums, with a, you know, and MD5 sum sure is a pretty large key space, like no one's gonna dispute that. But I'm guessing a few of you probably could pretty accurately get a couple of videos over a long enough timeline by hitting S3 buckets. Um, and in this case, none of the files are actually encrypted and none of them have any authorization or other, other access control. So if you know the path to a file, you can just hit that HTTP endpoint and get the file back. N no encryption, nothing else. What's better about this is that I deleted a file using their mobile app, and two months later, the file was still there. So imagine for a second, you have a camera that records you based on audio and motion. I had this in my living room, and I have a house, so occasionally I might walk downstairs, perhaps nude, and perhaps my dog might bark at random things, and perhaps the camera might make a recording of that. Um, so extrapolate to any number of cases that you guys can come up with. You not only have an unencrypted video of yourself on the internet in a shared S3 bucket with hard-coded you know, uh, AWS credentials, but you can actually delete the file off the internet. It's all in the cloud, guys. Um, the other service is YoICS, and YoICS actually does the streaming component. So, so Intellivision does the recording, uh, and YoICS does the streaming. So in terms of the streaming, effectively all you're doing is making a proxy. You're actually reaching out, connecting to an endpoint on their network in, on the internet somewhere, and then when your phone reaches out to say, I wanna stream video, two minutes, uh, it actually connects back and then streams right through your network. Turns out they use one IP and a decided number of ports, and those are not protected whatsoever. So if you happen to scan that IP and a certain number of ports, you'll see everyone's video's cameras live. Um, API calls, unencrypted, because why would you encrypt anything with API calls? Uh, I did a quick showdown search. There, there was a few cameras out there. Um, now this was one search, so you, know, you might find some more. And again, this was looking for Telnet, so who knows. Uh, so issue summary, nothing HTTPS, Telnet for upgrades and God only knows what else. API calls, re, uh, replay attacks for digest mode. RTSP is streamed and clear, so if you have co-tenant on the Wi-Fi, you can view all the video. Hard-coded credentials for three Linux accounts. Uh, backdoor website to view all the video streams with hard-coded credentials that you can't change. S3 buckets, single bucket, hard-coded credentials, no encryption. Um, and, H, you know, in some awesome cases, they did MD5 over, over HTTP, which was their best security that I saw. The FTC came down on TrendNet, like I mentioned earlier. They gave them security program like headaches and said 20 years of regulation and all this other shit. Um, surprisingly enough, guys, the FTC is actually doing a really good job at watching some of the Internet of Things things that are happening. Uh, so if you hear about Edith Ramirez doing something, it's probably actually for the better. Uh, so that's my talk. Um, thank you for having me at ShmooCon. This is my fifth year, so I'm excited to be back and talk to you guys later.
That's it. And so just uh, down or right? It's just down, I guess. All right. I, it, it Is that thing there? Is what? that thing going to be there? What thing? No, 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 that's not there. Okay. All right. Big boy. Thanks. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Bob Stratton, and uh, I want to talk to you about two things. Um, one is what we can learn from other disciplines, and the other is something that really surprised me, which is they're almost in the real world from the government is something that looks like a get out of jail free card. And it turns out it's for a good reason, but that alone was kind of shocking to me. So do we have any pilots in the room? Any hands? Yeah, like, like you know, the kind you can sit in. Um, you don't have to ask that, right? There are pilots around. Yeah, they'll tell you. <laughs> Existence proof, right? So uh, I put the funny letters after my name because I find it amusing. According to the FAA, I'm a certificated private pilot. I don't think that's a word either, but that's the one they always use. So uh, by way of background, I've done a bunch of uh, security startups, ran security and ISP, but the thing that kind of drove me to this talk is that I come from a family that has a computing background and an aviation background. Um, my dad was this, in the second customer engineering class back when computer companies had cool names at Sperry Univac. And my great grandfather is a member of a small group of folks who flew before World War I. Uh, so there's a group called the Early Birds of Aviation. And if you go up the street to Independence Avenue, to the Air and Space Museum, in the early flight gallery, there's a plaque. There are a bunch of names on the plaque. Uh, the, the two smallest at the top are Wright, Orville, and Wright, Wilbur. But if you look through there, you'll see a bunch of names that you may still see today, um, Cessna and Curtis and a bunch of others. And way over there on the right is my great granddad. So somebody in every generation since him in my family has been a pilot. So I was thinking about this and I realized that these are two industries where, in both cases, bad things happen. You want to try to stop bad things from happening, and you'd like to try to figure out what you can learn to maybe not do the same dumb thing again. And I think it's also interesting, you know, both sectors, depending on who you talk to, uh, acknowledge they can't fully eliminate risk. So you have to get good at learning lessons from things. But there is one difference that I've observed, and Folks may disagree with me, but uh, I think the information security community is really good at tracking bugs in things and in software. But we are not particularly optimized for tracking and recording and learning from operational workflow, process, screw-ups, mistakes, fumbles, you know, mistyping, and the, the you know, one that comes to mind is like when Pakistan was trying to block YouTube internally, they announced a route that black holed it for the whole planet, you know, stuff like that. Um, but aviation is actually really pretty good at that. And, you know, there are a couple of reasons for this, right? Nobody wants to admit that they've screwed up because you might incur liability, you might give your customers an edge, but really it's mainly because you don't look dumb. Uh, but there are some reasons that it's worth it. It's worth doing. You know, the, it, certainly in the air, aviation case, I don't want people to hit me in, uh, when I'm in an airplane. Um, in any discipline, I don't care what it is, you become more effective as you learn lessons. And frankly, and I say this based on my old incident response uh, history, I'd much rather be playing video games than getting phone calls at four in the morning. So I'd like to learn from what I can. So if you look at how aviation does it, the first really important thing to note is that in the definitions and the legal history and things, the primary mission of the Federal Aviation Administration is to promote aviation safety. And to, to their credit, they instituted a voluntary reporting system in 1975, and it took them a grand total of about three months to figure out that because they were also the enforcement mechanism and that they might have a legal obligation to act on anything 
that anyone told them that that might not work out right. So they actually went into a partnership with NASA, who does not have any enforcement authority, but does have subject matter expertise. Um, but the people who this is trying to serve are really everyone in the system. It doesn't matter what your job is. If you have anything to do with aviation, you're part of the system because you're the one doing the job and you, on a day-to-day -day basis, see what might go wrong. But you don't want to get in trouble, right? So they created a system called the Aviation Safety Reporting System. And they use NASA, who are subject matter experts in things that fly, but are not enforcement authorities. And they collect reports. They, uh, in their charter, have a mission to preserve the anonymity of users. But they give you a way to document that you reported something if it ever goes south or somebody figures out what happened. And then they do a really good job of publishing what they learn. So for example, out of this data they collect, they publish a monthly report, and if you think about it sort of like the mishap flavor of the month, you know, it's everything from equipment problems to uh, user interface issues in controls and uh, consoles and air traffic control to just workflow things like I was distracted when I was trying to land and things didn't go quite right and I deviated on my altitude, which by the way can get you in trouble. Uh, but any kind of mistake or mishap or screw up, they capture in the system and they do amazing analysis. It's all up there on the web. I have the URL at the end. Uh, you can read them yourself. And they'll do flavor of the month. You know, runway incursions is this month. And you'll hear all these, you'll read all these uh, anonymized reports like I was doing this and I got this, I looked down at my iPad and crossed a runway boundary and oops, that was bad. Um, but one interesting thing, they've been doing this since 1975, they've got more than one million reports submitted and NASA has never had a breach of user anonymity in this process. Yeah, I know, I was, I was kind of shocked. Um, so what is it, how does it really work? Well, there's a form. The top part of the form, you actually have your identifying information that you're, you know, who you are. When you submit it, NASA timestamps it, cuts it off, and mails it back to you. If things go wrong, you pull that out. The rules are designed so that in FAA policy, they say we will view that as evidence of a constructive attitude, which means they'll give you a little bit of benefit of the doubt. But in law, it says they will not use something from this report to go after you for enforcement. And there are a few criminal exceptions, but it's actually amazingly broad immunity. Uh, and so I, I view it as one of a very few amazingly enlightened government programs that actually seems to accomplish what it was uh, s set out to, to do. So how does this apply to information security? We're really good at reporting product stuff and code stuff, but we really don't have broadly deployed systems for workflow reporting issues. I don't know, I mean, I've worked at ISPs and I have a lot of friends in the, in the network provider space. Other than like the Nanog mailing list, I'm not sure we have a way to actually capture data on how people screw up and how to avoid doing it again. And in the security space, uh, there are islands of this, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about to figure out how we might be able to more uh, pervasively deploy things that aren't just looking at code, but are actually looking at how we work. You know, we complain about the users all the time. It's not just the users, it's the users and the admins. I'd be happy if we just captured data about how the admins do what they do and what works and what doesn't work. So like I say, it's not about bugs in stuff necessarily, it's about what happened during your day. And for me, the, the second order value proposition is I'd much rather have the reporting and analysis of this kind of information be coming from people who actually understand the space than Joe Random Media reporter, and apologies to any press who happen to be in the room. So who could do it? Well, you can try and do it within your organization, but it's gonna require will, and it's gonna probably require the CEO's buy-in to say, I'm not gonna go after people who make a mistake and disclose it voluntarily. Um, there are cases uh, that are analogous to this. You know, certainly there are ethics hotlines and things like that that are roughly analogous to this. 
I'm not going to say it's always going to be easy in every company. You know, some people like to take the easy route of assigning blame, but I will argue that if that's the tack you take, you are actively and uh, antithetical to improving security of your enterprise. Uh, if you're in a sector that has a government regulator, I actually think NIST might be a place that could kind of do this, right? They have some subject matter expertise, uh, and they're not regulators other than for what time it is. Um, <laughs> and they're pretty good at that. Uh, but, you know, it's, I, I'm really trying to foster discussion and, and, and contemplation and some collaboration about how we might get better at this. Uh, there is potentially an angle to start a, a nonprofit for this. Uh, you know, the ISACs, mm. uh, the Information Sharing Analysis Centers, sort of do this, uh, but it's mostly around incident data and things that machines do. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that the federally funded R&D centers would love to uh, get money to, to do something like this. I'm not sure that they're necessarily plugged into sort of the real world commercial workflow necessarily uh, as much as people actually in those enterprises. So, you know, I would love to hear from anybody in the course of uh, thinking about this who knows about other things that are out there that are analogous, that are oriented towards people and what people do and what goes wrong, um, what works, what's there that I may not know about. Uh, if there are things that you feel are kind of there but not giving you what you need, I'd love to understand what they don't do that, that you think might help. And uh, if you're interested in learning about the Aviation Safety Reporting System, it's run out of NASA Ames, um, the URL's up there. And uh, it is, even if you're not a pilot, even if you don't know anything about aviation, there's actually some, some pretty compelling reading in, in some of it. Uh, and it's not all bad news. So uh, mm. with that, that's it for me, and uh, thank you very much. Rash. Uh, I work for Extreme Networks, uh, but everything I'm going to say here are my own opinions. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about defensive technologies, uh, and that's perhaps not uh, as interesting to some of you, but it's certainly important. Uh, I think that there's a lot of room for improvement in that area, as we all probably know. So um, this talk fundamentally is about how to improve, I think, uh, the SNORT signature language, and I'm not going to get into the signature versus rules debate here, but uh, the SNORT signature language for a particular style of attack delivery. And in particular, um, just a quick fl uh, primer on flow bits. The flow bits keyword in SNORT's language is, a, I think, a very powerful keyword. Uh, it allows you to essentially take a set of signatures and have them work together as a group in order to try to more effectively detect certain kinds of uh, network traffic, uh, malicious activity, or other things that you may be interested in. So at the bottom here are two SNORT rules that are uh, designed to show, that you, show you that you can, uh, within IMAP communications, if you're interested in, let's say, the IMAP list command, uh, but you only want that rule to fire if you previously had seen a successful login from the same uh, the same over the same TCP connection. So this, these two rules show you that you can bi-directionally uh, have uh, flow bits criteria apply to both sides of a connection. That's great. Uh, another, another good example that's not listed here is if you have a, a condition with a vulnerable service that for which the, the trigger condition is uh, is, is triggered very early on in the TCP connection, say you're, you're able to tr uh, trigger a use after free kind of problem. 
Um, but then if the attacker is able to control how much data is then transferred after that condition is triggered, before then a follow-on uh, usage of that problem is then, uh, is then done, then it can be very difficult for SNORT to be able to track that because if you have, let's say, 100 megabytes worth of data between the two things, then uh, in the absence of flow bits, SNORT would not do uh, very much uh, good there. But flow bits saves you in that case because you can set a flow bit on the first criteria and then just test it arbitrarily deep in that TCP connection for the follow-on condition that you're trying to trigger. Very powerful. However, there is one very significant limitation in flow bits, which is that you cannot have flow bits apply across multiple TCP conversations, or I should say transport layer conversations here because UDP is also applicable. So I can't set a flow bit on one TCP connection and then test it within a separate, totally separate connection. But does this matter? So put another way, if there were to be a, an extension of flow bits or perhaps a new keyword that gives you the ability to set a bit on one connection and test it within a separate connection, would you gain a benefit in terms of attack detection, better attack detection? So a way to approximate an answer for that question is look for Metasploit modules for which reliable exploitation requires multiple conversations. So a good first pass is look for TCP connect calls, the TCP uh, connect UDP is the UDP version of that for UDP traffic and send request CGI of course interacts with web servers but behind the scenes it's also using a TCP connect call. Quick approximation, searching through the Metasploit Git repository, uh, this gives you a, so, some evidence that there are multiple, many actually, hundreds of Metasploit modules that do appear to require multiple uh, TCP connect calls. It requires a little bit further val uh, validation, of course, because you might have certain connect calls that are listed, but they're, they're wrapped with if statements or something, so they don't get actually always called when you try to exploit something. Uh, but at least uh, through some additional work, you can, uh, it is certainly true that many of them do actually use uh, multiple, uh, multiple calls. So a good example of one, and I wrote a blog post about this a few months ago, um, the Content Keeper web application versions prior to 125.10 uh, is vulnerable, uh, contains a vulnerability that has a very reliable way of exploitation through Metasploit. Um, but uh, this, the particular way in which this vulnerability is exploited requires two independent TCP conversations. Now, I'm not going to get into the HTTP persistence ideas here because that may, be, may apply too, but the point is the Metasploit code itself is implemented in a way that uh, uploads a base64 encoded Perl script to this uh, MIME encode, uh, MIME encode CGI application which is sort of the entry point to the vulnerability and this spam keeper dot dat is a file that is influenceable by the attacker and that's where the base64 encoded Perl script is uploaded and then it is executed via a follow-on HTTP get call. So even independently of the Metasploit check function which looks for a 500 internal error from that same MIME encode script, um, even in the absence of that reliable exploitation requires two TCP conversations. There are other examples as well. The SCADA 7 technology IGSS rename overflow is, is one that you might be interested in. And this Apache IS API DOS uh, exploits a use after free condition in the mod IS API uh, module uh, that again requires two independent conversations. Uh, for that last one, uh, an, an aborted call uh, creates um, this use after free condition, which is then exploited in a subsequent, uh, a subsequent connection. There are certainly more like this. So the, the part of this talk is a proposal for a new keyword, and we can, uh, if I had more time, we can go to some of the trade-offs, I suppose, but I think it needs to be a new keyword because backwards compatibility is certainly important. Um, changing the model under which flow bits operates uh, just by extending flow bits itself might create some issues. But X bits for crossing the streams. 
So the idea fundamentally is be able to set an X bit on one TCP or transport layer conversation and test it within a totally separate conversation, whether or not the first one has closed or not. Underlying semantics for modifiers to X bits would be the same as flow bits. So in particular, set, unset, no alert, et cetera, would all be the same. But there would need to be two additional modifiers at least. One where you'd be able to track by IP pair or destination port or any other sort of, you know, TCP IP tuple combination that you would like. And then also expire. Because if you remember the content keeper uh, instance we just talked about, the act of uploading the Base64 encoded Perl script, that TCP conversation is going to close and then it is executed in the follow-on connection, which means that if we're going to track traffic in this way, the X bit that we set on the first connection needs to remain resident even after the first connection is closed. But we don't want them to remain around forever within Snort's uh, process address space or a Suricata or anything else that's implementing uh, Snort-style signature language. Uh, so we need to have a way of expiring those X bits over time. This is an example of what uh, the SNORP rules would actually look like that would track this style of communication for the content keeper uh, exploit. I have an example of this on my website. I certainly can't write them all out here on this slide, but the fundamental idea is um, to set the X bit on the payload upload and then track to see whether or not it is, that payload is then actually executed uh, after the upload is successful. So of course, there are lots of trade-offs because you might say, well, just write a snort rule that looks for this MIME encode with this funny looking sort of permissions-ish sort of stuff that's sort of the entry point into the vulnerability. Um, that's fine. There's no reason why you can't also do that underneath the X bits model. But if you do get an alert for traffic like this, what's the first thing you're gonna do as a security analyst? Well, your, your next natural question is, was what they uploaded actually then executed, which means that you're going to have to do the same kind of thing that experts could have done for you within Snort's language. So why not promote that concept into the language itself? Uh, you could also imagine architectures where, where maybe you could implement this today within shared object rules or something like that. That's fine, but it is my belief that um, this style of intrusion detection is important enough to promote it into the core language itself via a new keyword. There are certainly performance implications that may get, uh, that, that may affect proper operations. Um, some IDSs are multi-threaded, like for example, Suricata is multi-threaded, so you're gonna have issues with respect to threads not having a global view of all traffic perhaps. And you have the same thing within Snort's world too, where you have multiple Snort processes that are being fed data that's split by network processors or Gigamon taps or other kinds of architectures. So um, nevertheless, I think that if you think a little bit more broadly even than this, applications these days themselves have long since thrown by the wayside just individual uh, communications. You know, you have lots and lots of things that happen you know, think about anything that uses a signaling protocol. I mean, FTP has done this for decades. Um, you have, uh, you know, DNS requests, you have BitTorrent and things like this that are by design using multiple conversations to transmit data, uh, share information, etc. It therefore is a corollary to that, that the attacks will over time too. And I believe that the Metasploit project provides kind of a roadmap for seeing how that may be done over time. So, um, in the SIM world, I believe that part of the SIM vendor's success, in some sense, it can be tracked to the fact that they have a style of detection that's very similar to this by design. They don't care that you get a failed login alert from one piece of infrastructure with a snort alert for some, from something else. They are doing this sort of uh, correlation by design. I think that there's room for the network IDS community to also do some similar style of, uh, of essentially correlation across transport layer conversations directly within the language. So writing a second edition of my Linux firewalls book, I intend to cover X bits here. 
uh, within this second edition. I would love it if any of you have feedback for me on this, uh, or if you have any questions. Wow, we may actually have a fire talk where there's time for questions. Questions, please. <laughs> yes. Ah, great question. So the question was, what's next for X bits? Is there, you know, any, you know, con is there a development effort started yet? Um, I talked a little bit with the Suricata guys, and uh, it sounds like that they may start moving in some direction similar to this. Uh, whether or not it actually becomes X bits uh, here, uh, you know, I'm not sure, but I think that they they probably agree with the, the core idea. Snort community, I'm not really sure. We'll see. Anything else? Yes. So you pointed out, uh, talking about vectors that require multiple connections <laughs> or conversations, but really it, it, it's any exploit that can be split up to try and bypass conventional IDS definitions. It's more of a comment than a question. Yes, so I think, I think your comment is that this would apply to any exploit that can be split across multiple conversations. Is that accurate? Yes, so absolutely. Um, I think that, um, so, so I, I would agree with that statement. I, I'm not sure, I mean, t typical IDS evasions, I, I would say, have kind of, you know, w with respect to TCP, have always played in the, you know, send and attack a byte at a time and, you know, spoof orphan TCP act packets that contain traffic that matches the signature set and stuff like that. Um, I haven't seen so many evasions, I guess, that are literally truly instantiating new connections, but splitting the exploit payload across those totally separate connections. Um, that would actually be an interesting question to try to figure out how possible is that to do for, you know, across the exploit set for Metasploit, for example. Yeah, that's the Apache IS API DOS uh, exploit is, is a great example of that. Any other questions? Thank you very much. beer to her. Someone give her a free beer. Yeah. Someone give her a free, what do you like? Malibu. All right, here we go. That's on camera, isn't it? Not yet. All right. All right, here we go. Oh, you know what I got? Um, what's that? Flux on? Flux on? Uh, what's flux? So the power yeah. saving thing? Or? Power saving. Oh, Whatever. We'll do it live. <laughs> Alright. No. Flux. Is it going? Is it going full screen out there? Yeah, we're in both places. We stop recording. Is it progressing right now? I can't see anything over here. All right, here we go. Primary monitor. All right, we're good. I'm starting to 
You're not seeing it? I don't remember the rest, but your mother's a whore. Don't open that. Don't open that for a little while. All right, is it shaking up? <laughs> All right, thank you. You got it. You good? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I would just go to 17. We're good? We're good? Good? All right, let's go ahead. We'll do it live. I'm going to try to keep this in the 15 minute time frame. It's not auto advanced. This is another log to analyze. Uh, utilizing DNS logs or packet captures to discover malware within your in unique environment. My name is Nathan Monnier. I am a senior computer uh, network operator uh, with telecommunication systems, specifically Art of Exploitation. I do instruction and I also do pen testing on the side uh, for them. Um, I also do some work with Hackers for Charity, but that's not too important for this talk. So let's go ahead and keep rolling. All right, so we're going to talk about finding malware within your network utilizing your DNS logs or, and or packet captures. Um, so even though malware utilizes DNS logs, those logs are typically underutilized as a security asset. Um, we're going to go ahead and discover or try to talk about how we can go ahead and discover malware in our network through talking about establishing DNS query and response baselines. That's going to be a topic that's going to be very important. We need to know what is normal for your particular environment. Everything's going to fluctuate for your own unique environment. So we have to have a baseline for that. We also need to have an uh, analyze NX domain responses. Is it advancing on me? Um, NX domain responses are basically when you fat finger something that comes back and it says, I cannot resolve that, resp uh, that query for you. We're going to talk about that further here in a second. Uh, we also need to analyze the successful DNS queries that go out. So what are my users querying and where are they going out to on the world on the internet? Um, and specifically, once we find that, we need to identify uh, domain name anomalies or something that's suspicious within our user environment. Uh, so we, get, we need to have a traffic baseline. Um, so we need to have that normal to compare everything else to, to contrast the apples to oranges. So we need to know what's normal. Yeah. Uh, specifically the top level domains or TLDs for short and also second level domains. So the dot coms for TLDs, the uh, google.com for second, uh, second level domains as well. We also need to know which hosts and servers are doing that as well. So what's normal for our unique environment? Who is going where? Who is querying out to the internet and where are they going to? What's normal for an everyday, month, day, uh, excuse me, uh, hourly, weekly, monthly type of deal. And also, who is my top DNS queries? Where are they going out to? Um, per host, network, domain, or site, if you can get that granular. Um, what is normal also for your HR department? It's gonna differ very, it's gonna vary greatly for your IT department, right? Your security folks. Um, and also, specifically, what is normal for your time of day usage? So. 8 to 5, I know I'm going to have a high spike of bandwidth, and also, you know, at 2 a.m., I'm expecting nothing on my network besides the people that are working shifts. So you have to have that baseline to go and compare things to. Uh, before we move on, we're going to talk about uh, DGA, which is also known as Domain Generation Algorithm. Malware utilizes this to go ahead and contact its command and control servers. So we're going to talk about DGA for short. C2 for short for command and control server. So DGA is basically an algorithm that the malware on your user environment or whatever it's uh, infected on 
um, knows the algorithm. Uh, your command and control server knows it as well. They're going to go ahead and um, compute that. They're going to uh, compute a list of candidate domain names. And let's say for ease of use, 10 particular domain names. Nine of those are going to fail. One of them is going to be successful so the malware can communicate to its C2 server. Of those, we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, the, the nine that basically failed for us and that was going to indicate which host on our system is actually infected. Um, Configur Configur specifically utilizes this technique as well. It's being adopted um, by other malware as a backup strategy and um, basically to uh, uh, get around blacklisting for a, a static list of IP address to contact command and control servers. So uh, like I talked about before, NX domain responses are commonly a result of fat fingering something. So I type google.com with three O's. It comes back. I cannot resolve that because it's not a valid domain name or a fully qualified domain name, FQDN. Um, that response there is going to get a uh, NX domain response. It's not going to get the, okay, I resolve that name for you. It's good. It's going to get that NX domain response. That's going to be helpful for us when we're looking through our logs to see what's going on in our environment. Um, particularly also with DGA, like we just mentioned, let's say an example that 10 of them were, uh, 10 candidate host names were uh, launched, nine of them failed, nine of them are going to get NX domain responses, one of them is going to get a valid response. So we need to know what's normal for NX domain responses as well on our particular environment. And if you can get granular, hour, weekly, on down the line. So if your average NX domain response for your entire network is 25 roughly for your entire network, and then you see a spike of 50 or let's say 10 from one particular host on your network, well then that machine is probably infected because the amount of NX domain responses on that machine is too damn high, right? There's too many NX domain responses over my threshold of what's normal for my network. You guys like that meme? I try to cut out a lot of memes. I don't got a lot of time. All right. We also need to query for a lot of uh, malicious domains. And this is the known bad, right? Not the unknown unknowns, like Donald Rumsfeld said. We need to look for the known bad, right? So let's go ahead and look for what's known that's bad out there. What, what hosts or what domain names are already known to be hosting malware? So go ahead and take that information that's freely available to you on these resources on the, from the community, such as malwaredomains.com or malwaredomainlist.com. Look for that in your particular environment. If you see something, that's probably abnormal. Identify that machine, take it offline, re-image it 18 times. Take it off your network, burn it with fire. All right, we also need to analyze the DNS traffic as well. So there's going to be a lot of information here. Um, specifically, if we're doing a packet capture, there's going to be way too many packets. Um, it's going to be information overload. You're going to spend way more time analyzing things than you will be collecting those things because it happens like that, and analyzing things doesn't happen like that. So focus right now on the NX domain responses. We can go ahead and see, hey, is malware going, is utilizing DGA? It's querying out there. It's sending out three from this host every hour. Okay, that's abnormal because we don't have that many in our environment per hour. Utilize your baseline to compare everything to and compare and contrast what the responses you have are compare, uh, compared to what you're getting from a, a machine that's particularly infected. Um, if you find a machine that has too many NX domain responses, analyze that. Is it a result of a fat finger, like google.com with three O's? Okay, that's a common thing maybe, but a string of consonants and letters and numbers together are, is not particularly normal. So utilize your brain power there um, to analyze that information. And also, does it include suspicious domain names? And we'll talk about what particularly makes something suspicious to us or anomalous. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> of the successfully resolved domains, are there any known malicious as well? So we just talked about where to find known malicious, utilize that resource to compare and contrast that too as well. All right, so what makes something anomalous or suspicious to you or your environment? Well, uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is, a, is domain name length. So typically, uh, greater than 12 to 15 characters falls outside what's normal for a top, uh, excuse me, a second level domain name, something that's memorable for somebody to memorize. Typically, it's within the eight character range. So you think of like facebook.com as eight characters. 
uh, google.com that falls below the eight characters, right? So anything that's greater than that, when you're looking through a log and you're doing a cursory look through all the sections of, let's say, your log list, and you start to streamline down through, um, eight characters, 10 characters, 12, all the way down through, and then you see something that's, you know, 15 or 33 in the uh, example of Zeus, that's gonna catch your eye, right? So uh, focus on that as well. We also wanna uh, pay attention to character contents. Um, so alphanumeric strings, as I al already talked about, um, letters, numbers, just str uh, flown together. That particular domain name, uh, 2kjpdsf on down the line dot com, is available because nobody wants it because nobody can memorize that, right? So that's something that's going to be probably available to a malware author or somebody that wants to communicate to a command and control or that's going to have a command and control server for its infected users to communicate to. So pay attention to that too. So um, typically these may not also fall outside of the range of what's normal with the content length as well. So on a cursory look, this may look normal as well. Um, so another thing to pay attention to is doppelganger domains. So this would be something like uh, cnyahoo.com instead of cn.yahoo.com. So missing the dot between the subdomain and the second level domain. Also misspelling. So an example there from Mandiant. And their APT1 report is aolonline.com, but one of those L's is using a one instead of an L. So on a cursory look, when you're looking through a log, it may not stick out to you depending on the font that you're using. Also, double vowels or missing consonants. Um, in this example, facebock.com. So something that may, you may graze over, just like if you're looking through, you know, um, a, a task list and you see service hosts, you see a lot of service hosts or something like that, you may graze over the one that's actually malware. Oops. So, and also a thing to pay attention to is top level domains. Where am I connecting out to? Dot com, most likely all the time. Am I in America? Most likely dot com. Am I in Europe? Dot EU, right? Or dot co dot UK if I'm in the uh, UK. We need to know where my top level domains I'm connecting out to. Do I have a business case for connecting out to .ru? Do I have a business case to connect out to .cn? Why are my users connecting out to that environment as well? So everything that you see there may be suspicious for your own unique environment. Um, are those top level domains associated with hosting command and control servers? Are they known or notorious for infosec crime? And then also less common top level domains such as uh, .biz or .info, those may not be bad, but I mean, let's be honest, everyone uses, try to, tries to use .com. Um, so some tools that we're going to talk about to uh, separate the bad information, or not bad information, but the, uh, the information overload from what we need to look at here are, is going to be DNS top and uh, passive DNS. The first one is DNS top. It can either be used as a live capture or it can uh, feed in a PCAP file to it as well. It's only going to take in TCP information, so that's one, uh, one, excuse me, one little flaw from it. But what we can see here is uh, on the far left side is the query sources. Who is querying out? We can also see who is querying out and to where. The query source on the far right side, query source and second level domain. Where are they going to and who is doing that query? We can also see the query types, which doesn't really fit in this category and also the, in the middle there, the first level query names and second level query names. Another tool is called Passive DNS. Um, one benefit to this is it has a nice GUI because sometimes you can't really stand looking at a terminal screen anymore. You need to look at a nice web page or something, a nice product. Uh, this has that added benefit. What we can do here is also search by, don't advance, um, specific type of records. Uh, a records, B records, C name, MX uh, records, all that information that you do from like a dig query. Also we can do special reports there in that second column there. Uh, NX domain specifically like we already talked about. So what did not get resolved on my network? I have this packet capture, feed it into the passive DNS. What did not make it out to the internet? One of my machines was trying to get out there to this specific domain. I want to see all of those. And then also you can do advanced search as well, so you can do a logical and, so you can do a specific known bad, uh, fully qualified domain name such as evilmalware.com, oops, don't advance on me, evilmalwaresite.com, and then the answer of nxdomain.com. 
Um, you can sp uh, specify a specific date. So if you, you have uh, intelligence from, let's say, um, a, a blog write-up, you can go ahead and query inside of your specific environment for a specific timeline. Did I have any of this going out to this specific site on this date and time? Uh, final, uh, finally, we can go ahead and analyze the traffic of suspected hosts. What connections are those hosts making? Um, where have they gone in the past? If we see that they did make this connection to a bad site or tried to query out to a malware site, where did they go before that to get infected? So we need to go ahead and figure out where they went before as well. Um, excuse me. Um, has the C2 server been rotating through hosting infrastructure? So is it doing fast flux DNX, uh, dynamic DNS, stuff like that? Um, the IP address in question, where it's connecting out to ultimately, is it an IP address that's a server farm that's hosting legitimate websites? Is it hosting a legitimate website that has a business case that my users need to connect to? I can't block that IP address because I need my users to get out to that IP address for another, uh, for legitimate business. So I can't just go ahead and do that. So we need to go ahead and set up some sort of black holing for that. And then ultimately we need to go ahead, once you find this information, share it with the community, right? Defense is not sexy, offense is sexy, right? Hacking things is sexy, defense kind of blows, right? Right, it's really hard. <laughs> it's much more fun to cause the mayhem than to find the mayhem, right? I know exactly what I want to do to your environment, I don't know what you've done to my environment. So share this information freely. If you have to do it anonymous, do it. If not, you know, share it freely. I think that about wraps it up. I might have gone over my 15 minute time limit. If you have any questions, if we have any time, no more time, oh, I'm sorry. You can contact me here or I'll be off stage off to the side here at hackhunger.com, um, facebook.com slash hackhunger, or you can find me at the HFC booth or Art of Exploitation booth in the main lobby. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you guys coming out. Plays at that anymore? There, is that good? Apparently uh, not. <coughs> are you doing it on the remote screen? Or only are you using mirrors of the screen? Or are you having a phone? Well, you tell me. Can you see what I'm doing? Every contact is kind of at the end. We had to rush through some of the stuff, so this is more of just the end, the the, the uh, of the uh, talk. So. This is a little bit about me, you don't care. Hi. I care. No, you don't. Oh, I don't. <laughs> okay. So um, when we had the DerbyCon talk, uh, it was kind of a continuation of Brett Moore's work he did back in 2012 of um, all the different ways you can escalate privileges on Windows. So we just added to that. There was a whole spiel about go check out his shit too. So first off is WinRM. Anyone in the room know what WinRM is or Windows Remote Management? It's an amazing tool for attackers. Um, so basically what it is is uh, the ability to issue WMI commands onto a remote system over HTTP. And this is authentication that happens over HTTP by default. Great. So no longer if you, like, if you have to uh, uh, create a service on a system, no longer you have to do that. Windows, Vista and above have WinR WinRM by default. You flip a switch inside of an organization. The greatest thing about this whole thing is 
I can actually ask Active Directory where the WinRM enabled systems are. So I just say, hey, when are you, where, where can I execute code without having to bypass any or create any services? And that's great. The coolest thing about this whole thing is that if you install IIS on the box, it automatically switches to port 80. So if you request a, an I, if you see an IIS box on a pen test or something, then the, all you have to do is throw a slash WS man like all lowercase, if you get a response that isn't like 404, you know that you can execute code. Well, if that's on the DMZ, you're, go you're done. Game over. And plenty of Metasploit modules to help you get through that process. So injecting into CAs, um, certainly useful for doing all kinds of sorts of evil things. Um, if you have a CA on your cert, you can whitelist binaries, you can sign code. Um, you can do all sorts of other things. Uh, and a good thing you want to do is maybe proxy SSL traffic. Um, if you submit an SSL cert to the browser, um, super useful. The guy who wrote it's actually in the room. Hi. So WPAD, I talked about this in defensive stuff, but it's also fun as an offense. So um, if you don't know what WPAD is, and I've actually had people come up to me and, and want more explanation on this. So basically it's, um, a, a computer name that a, a Windows system, if it has this checkbox turned on, will request out and broadcast and say, hey, WPAD, are, do you exist? And the attacker can say, yes, I do exist, I am WPAD. Then, for whatever stupid reason Microsoft decided to do this, it makes an HTTP request for WPAD.dat on port 80, which is a proxy configuration in JavaScript. So all you have to do is say, hey, all of your stuff, proxy it through me, please, and, and it's game over from there on out. This also works on um, IPv6, too, so if you have this installed, it looks for WPAD as well on IPv6, and you can say, hey, yes, I'm IPv6, I will give you WPAD. I will give you proxy settings. So who uses port proxy? Who's heard of it? That's like more than, actually that's mostly Nova hackers, so you've only seen, <laughs> seen it at the talks because we've talked about this a couple times. So super useful because you can proxy things from IPv4 to IPv6 and 6 to 4 and some other cool things. What's useful for that is, say you want to have an XFIL box, you can now say when I connect to this thing on this port, I want you to go ahead and tunnel out to the internet over IPv6. So you've essentially made your tunneling device, you don't have any malware on that except for a port proxy rule. You can have all your other pieces of malware inside the organization actually talk to it and it funnel it out to you. So it'll make all the incident responder guys life pretty hard. Very hard. <laughs> and there's a Metasploit module. So one of the cool ways you can use this um, is, uh, I don't know if anyone's in the room seen the LNK stuff, but essentially it's a, a shortcut file that you can create with an icon to a, that the icon doesn't exist on a share. You say, the icon for this sh shortcut is on this non-existent share. Well, what happens is when someone sees that, when someone just pulls up the, uh, the, the folder where that exists, they make a request to that icon so that they can preview it. Well, when that, I, when that happens, if it's on a local network, it authenticates to that share to try and get to it. So if I have a port proxy set up that says the share is on this server and um, port proxying port 80 and, and allowing so, some of the uh, web client-based web dev stuff to happen, it will actually victim two that sees this LNK, this shortcut file, will go to victim one where I have the port proxy set up. It'll see that it's an intranet you know, computer, intranet, sorry, intranet computer, and then the port proxy will forward the authentication out to my box. So now, I don't have anything inside your network except for a shortcut, a port proxy, and that's it. No malware, no nothing, and everything's done, and I'm getting all the authentication for anyone that views that share constantly. Cool stuff? Kind of useful. So um, we mentioned SSL cookies before, so um, another built-in tool to Windows is Logman, which allows you to log uh, SSL cookies, the post requests, the cookie data, uh, the get requests, and everything else. So, um, you know, SSL is our fix for all things uh, bad, and you can now capture all that stuff with built-in stuff, which is pretty cool. Thanks, Microsoft. Thank you. Um, 
the important part of that is it fills up really quick, so you need to kind of monitor that or have a way to exfil that. Um, Mark Baggett did a couple posts on that, and it's worth your time to read that stuff. Uh, so this wasn't as, as public as it could have been, um, but there was a blog post about uh, how NTL, or net NTLM is broken. Well, net NTLM is not used as much as it, uh, as it used to be, um, or the V1, it's usually V2 these days, but on HTTP requests, so SMB doesn't use it as much, but HTTP requests, you see it all the time. Um, and the cool thing about this is that he found out that there is some crypto voodoo that you can do to this net NTLM um, hash, which has the challenge response and all kinds of craziness to it, and break it down into something that cloudcrack.com can throw into some FPGAs for 23 hours, and then you, at the end, have an NTLM hash, straight NTLM. So now you can pass the hash all you want. So this is really cool. Um, I wouldn't recommend submitting any of your clients net NTLM hashes to this thing, just saying. But um, if you want to test this out, it works really well. Um, okay, so DEP. Uh, I don't know about uh, how many people like build their own binaries for, for malware and, and doing pen test stuff, but if you, if you build it on a Linux box, you're not gonna have DEP um, opt in on it. So most of the time, it's really hard to make it do it. So when you run it on a remote system and it doesn't work, if DEP is turned on for opt out or you have to say no on it, it's gonna make a little big, or a little big, a big pop up on the screen of whoever's logged in saying, hey, this tried to execute, would you like to approve it or not? It's not DEP compliant. Really bad, really, it sucks to, you know, that happen. Well, in Windows 2003, um, there is, at the bottom here, um, in Windows 2003, there's a, an undocumented function via a control panel that you can just throw in a command, like if you PS exec it over, that will tell you to automatically exclude this thing. So you can say, I'm gonna upload my evil binary, and then I'm gonna run this command to exclude it from DEP, and then now when I run it, it works. So in Windows 2008 and above, the registry hack that's above, uh, that's um, on the top actually works. Um, someone actually told me that later, but um, this is the bottom one's how you do 2003 and below. All right. Um, finally, we get to into um, zone transfers. So zone transfers are, are fun. They're, um, they're great uh, externally, but uh, internally they're much more damaging. So if you do any kind of pen test, normally when you, once you get into a network, you start scanning the network of your local range or, or or pinging certain things on the local range, or pulling down net view, right? Well, what if you could say, hey, Active Directory, just give me all of the DNS that you have. Well, if you're a domain admin, you can do that with WMI, with one single command, and you're done. It's great, except for one thing. You have to be a domain admin. Well, that sucks. So, if you've ever looked at AD Explorer, um, as, a, as a normal user on Active Directory, you can see all of the DNS entries. So why can't I do that as a normal user with a command line? I got really pissed, started looking around, um, and I finally found this, this awesome like, system administrator that was like, I can't um, dump my DNS entries because um, I need to import them in a new domain that I'm migrating to or whatever. So he made this great little PowerShell script that does it for you. So if you go on this GitHub, pull down dnsdump.ps1, you can throw in your domain, throw in the domain control you want it from, use a standard user, doesn't have to have any special privileges on the domain, and then you pull down every single DNS entry in that domain. That includes the routers, the switches, the Unix systems that you wouldn't get from a standard net view. This includes the you know, IP phones and anything else you put in DNS. So now, instead of only targeting um, Windows systems in your pen tests or trying to find you know, those phones or those Unix systems or, or those SCADA systems, now you just tell Active Directory to give you all the DNS internally and then you see all the static entries and then you say, oh, there's their ICS systems, done. And that's really it. So thank you very much. fast.
Good stuff? Okay. Good. Sucky. All right. Sucky. Bransfield. Oh, shit every day. It's awesome to go to work and look forward to it on Monday morning. And so people congregate around me and say, hey, tell me about your job. And they think, because they really want my job. And the joke's on them because uh, they can't have my job. They're going to carry me out of my office like sometime in the future. I'm going to be that guy who dies on like the Friday before a long weekend. And they're going to find me the following Monday or following Tuesday. And they're going to be like, yeah, see that, Jane, that stain over there on the floor? That was Gene. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is a work in progress. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I haven't been much done. But we're going to talk about putting tech on a pet. I'm going to talk about the valuable lessons learned I've done in the research so far. And we're going to talk about plans for future development. So, work it day, weaponizing your pets. Why in God's name would you want to do that? Yeah. Well, the background is this. I don't know if you realize that 15% of the world's internet traffic is dedicated to cats. This is an actual statistic out there, people. In fact, somebody did a database algorithm. They were playing around with it for a presentation, and they tried to determine the cutest cat on the internet, and they ran all this stuff on it, and they figured out the cutest cat on the internet is actually Halle Berry. So they went back and redid their algorithm. They came up with a picture of the cat, but I like Halle better, Berry as an answer better. But I find most tech briefings very boring, and if I find them boring and I'm a tech guy, then the layperson sitting next to me is probably just asleep. So I like to do my tech briefings involving cats and stories around cats. In fact, the picture that I use the most is this one. That's a great picture. <laughs> yes, that's the picture that started it all. So at one of the, my cat end presentations, I had somebody walk up to me and said that they were going to give me this collar that they just won in some sort of raffle. And this collar had a GPS chip on it, and it had a cellular component on it, and it would track where your cat has been. And if you were nervous about the cat, then you could send a text message to the collar that would text you back with the GPS coordinates of the cat in its current location. And me being the guy I am, I said, well, shit, all we need is a little Wi-Fi sniffer, and we've got a war kit. <laughs> And what about the denial service dog? Well, I was down at Outer Zone, which is something that uh, Sky Dog and company put on down in Atlanta every day. I think it was Lady Merlin brought in this dog, and it was like, really tricked out with backpacks and everything. It had Wi-Fi components in it, and it's like a couple of Wi-Fi hotspots, and they called it a Wi-Fi service dog. And I said, well, you should have put like a pineapple in it, run a D-off, and called it a denial of service dog. And they were like, oh, that's so much better. <laughs> so, exactly. So working animals are nothing new. We got military dogs over here. We got a badder ass dog right here. And this is the baddest ass dog of all. That guy is a halo jumper. You see the guy's wearing a mask? Dog's wearing a mask too. That's a badass dog. <laughs> but then we have actually real Navy SEALs. The Navy actually does work. <laughs> this is no bullshit. The Navy actually does work with SEALs in for harbor defense and munitions finding. They also work with dolphins, so you think you're doing a secret mission, all of a sudden Flipper comes out with an HD camera. Pop! Got you. <laughs> and then we got more Flipper over there walking around with a bottlenose. He's looking for uh, unexploded ordinances at the bottom of harbors and things like that. And rumor has it that they've done exercises with Navy SEALs and using real dolphins and things for harbor defense. And so the Navy SEAL's swimming along, thinking about all the cool shit he's going to get to blow up, and then this dolphin sort of swims by him, looks at him like, and the Navy SEAL blows it off because, you know, dolphins are in the water, too. And all of a sudden, bam, he gets it in the ribs with a bottlenose. He's like, screw this, I'm out of the water. I am not fighting a dolphin. <laughs> but one of the weirdest research projects ever confounded about by the United States government is this acoustic kitty. Now, this came around in the 60s, and apparently there was a lot of pot in the 60s. So some dude's like, okay, we're going to take a cat. I'm going to put a receiver in his ear and a wire down its back. And like a transmitter in his chest, we'll call it the acoustic kitty, it'd be awesome. <laughs> this actually got funded, according to everything you find on the internet. And they did a lot of research on it, and they actually came up and they did some testing. And, but unfortunately, on the first operational test they did in public, they walked out into a city street, they put the cat down, and the, as soon as the cat hit the ground, it ran off into the middle of the road and got smacked by a cab, and that was the, the end of acoustic kitty. And, the project was then defunded, not because the government said, okay, this is stupid, but because the engineers who were working on it going, yeah, we don't want to do this anymore. They're like, well, why? I said, because cats are just notoriously hard to work with. 
they're kind of like a passive aggressive ex who's just like, okay, you want me to make the payment? Oh, I sort of made the payment. It's like, they're just really disgustingly hard to work with and we don't want to do it anymore. We'd rather be working on stuff that works. But that's an interesting finding that we'll come back to later. So my stuff, the requirements. So we have a concept of operations here. We want to put a collar or harness on a cat, allow the cat to just walk around the neighborhood normally, Collis Harner's going to have some GPS tracking stuff, some Wi-Fi stuff, and we're just going to be doing a little bit of war driving, except we're using a cat. Now, requirement zero is cat shall not be harmed. I'm not the biggest fan of cats in the face of the planet, but I will not willingly go out there and just harm an animal. That's just not what I want to do. Uh, cats shall be able to comfortably wear stuff and should not be harmed by stuff by wearing stuff. This not only means that it will form and fit and let them to do his stuff, but we don't want it to have any flashing bits that some bird of prey is going to be flying over. So, what's that blue light? Oh, kitty! And that's the end. Yeah, we don't want that to happen. So the GPS is going to record waypoints with associated date timestamps. The Wi-Fi sniffer is going to sync up with the GPS unit, and when we get the cat back, we'll do some analysis on the stuff. Sounds pretty simple, right? So there's other products out there, like Mr. Lee Cat Cam is a little thing you can hook on a collar. There are other products, yes, there are other products out there. Not that do Wi-Fi sniffing, but there's something you can buy, you put on his collar, and it'll wander around and do GPS tracking, and it will take pictures from time to time so you can see where your cat has been. And there's Pet Tracker and the Garmin thing that will also do GPS tracking. This guy's hilarious over here, he's like laughing. How could somebody do this? <laughs> there are products out there that do this. But none of these things do Wi-Fi sniffing. So we're talking about what I need to do to get this done. So I was looking at several kinds of solutions. There's the gum sticks thing, which is pretty badass, but it's kind of expensive. It has everything you need in a rather small form factor. So that might work, but it's kind of expensive. Then we have the gum sticks, which I have around here. This is the gum sticks I got from Ricky Hill. This was flying over some stuff, do some Wi-Fi war hacking over here. This is a pretty good solution as well. And then we have the Rock Chip 3066. And this is something that you can hook up to your TV and it'll give you Wi-Fi HD streaming. There's also a Kali Linux image that you can put on this, which is pretty cool. But then as I was struggling to get all this stuff to work with everything I needed it to work, I sat down, had a beer, and I thought, okay, I need a small form factor, I need GPS, I need Wi-Fi, and I would like to have cellular. So does anybody have any idea what could possibly fit that requirement? How about a freaking cell phone? It was in my pocket the entire freaking time. So I got something small that will work, and we have it right there. So, okay, great. So I spent all this energy trying to think of something that's already been invented. So at least now I can do some cellular coding, right? You've got no cellular coding, Android coding, to do this Wi-Fi app thing, right? Well, yeah, they already thought of that too. It's called Wiggle. You just put the Wiggle on the Wi-Fi thing, and you walk around with it, and it does basically everything I need to do. So okay, so I have the tech part worked out. Now I need a volunteer cat. So we have a volunteer kitte. This kitte actually belongs to my friend Reeves. And this gives you some stats on this cat. This cat is 22 inches from base of neck to base of tail. He has a 20 inch chest and an 11 inch neck. This is a big freaking cat. So this cat's not going to mess with any, and nobody, none of his cat friends are going to come around and make fun of him because of the funny stuff we put on him because he'll kick the shit out of him. So. Now we need something to put on the cat. So we got a cell phone here that's not going to fit in a collar, so we need sort of like a dog coat thing for a cat. And if you enter cat coat in there then in Google, then you get a bunch of pictures of girls wearing coats that have cats on them. And if you enter kitty coat into Google, you get things that you shouldn't surf kitty coat from work. <laughs> Just put it. And then my friend Reeves sent me a picture of this, which is pretty cool. But I figured the dimensions of the cat were big enough that I could probably find a dog coat that would fit the cat and son of a bitch. Here we go. We got one right here. It actually fits the cat. So, plan is to put the tech in the coat, put the coat on the cat, send the cat out for a walkabout, recover data when the cat returns, and profit. Right? Yes. So, step one, tech goes in the coat, right? Step two, coat goes in the cat. Doesn't he look happy? <laughs> This is the happiest cat on the face of the planet right here. <laughs> yes. And then step three is we let the cat out. And now we have step four where we wait for the cat to come back and profit, right? Wrong. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that. That's his backyard. <laughs> he made it that far. So what's the solution to this? Well, we obviously didn't put it on tight enough. So you get the cat. <laughs> 
get the tech in the coat, get the coat on the cat, put it on real tight this time, right? And we send him back out again, and we wait. And we wait, and we wait, and we wait. And he's not coming back at his normal scheduled time. And we wait some more, and people are starting to get nervous, and all of a sudden at the back door we hear a meow. And we go to the back door, and bam. <laughs> now, I don't know if you noticed this, but I'm going to show you that there's a cat going out. There's a cat coming back. We're missing something, and it's the coat. And there's the last GPS hit on where we think the coat was, but we took a walk about, and it's not there. So, then we move on to lessons learned. Cats are really damn hard to work with. <laughs> and uh, uh, always test your stuff before you send out the expensive stuff when you're working with cats. So put the coat on him and see if he comes back with the coat before you put your cell phone in there, because then, then you're going to need another Amazon Prime account to go get another cat. But honestly, everybody was kind of scared that the cat didn't come back for a while, so we're not going to put the coat back on the cat and send him back out again. We're figuring, I figure we're going to work with a much smaller form factor with the same kind of capability. So talking to my friends, and they're recommending the, uh, the Arduino stuff, thinking we could probably get that taken care of, put it together, get it down to a form factor that will go in this little case here, which will actually fit around his collar. And we've got pictures of cats and collars wearing. This is one of the garment holder on things. So, tons of Arduino stuff out there. Like I said, this is a work in progress. So, stay tuned for more Kite action. So, now we move on to denial of service dog. And yeah, I got nothing yet. <laughs> I spent so much goddamn time working on the freaking cat. <laughs> but, plan of action is uh, we got pineapple that we can put in there. Uh, there's a TV be gone that you can put in there. And basically, <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. I figured that'd be great to work around Super Bowl time frame, walk down the street. Let's go for the touchdown. What the hell? Uh, Wi-Fi war mushing sounds good to me. But uh, another friend of mine sent me a white paper at the 22nd Usenix, which happened back in August here. It's a, uh, it's a uh, presentation called Let Me Answer That For You. Uh, OSMOCOM is open source uh, mobile communications. BB stands for baseband. And basically, they put some special sauce into the baseband of a phone, flashed the phone with that baseband, and they figured out that if they wanted to take over your particular cell phone, they could do that from their baseband. So all the text messages would, instead of going to you, they'd go to him. They also figured out that they could pretty much take out a cell tower and probably a large geographic area with this Osmocom BB, a uh, bunch of German guys. They did some really cool work, and that sounds like a lot of fun to play with. So. Uh, what do I do next? I don't know. A little backpack on a rabbit action going on. Yeah. So that's where I am with that. Thank you very much. Any questions? We're good? Thank you very much, guys. Yes, this is why you get your slides to Grex the night before. Um, we'll remember that one in future. So hi, my name is Sarah Clark, um, and we're going to talk about gender balance in tech, um, a project I've been doing and another project we're starting. Um, and I've been around for about 15 years, so I kind of have some experience here. My first hacker event was DC 2600 in 1998. Um, so about 15 years, and I have worked my way up from being a tech intern to being a senior security engineer. So I've, you know, I've kind of got an idea of what it is to be a woman in tech and a hacker in tech. And so I've got, you know, some room to talk here. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is Ladies Lunch Con. Um, we're also going to talk about gender ratio in tech because it's an important subject. Um, we're going to talk about some things that are being done that aren't working very well. And we're going to talk about ways to do it better. Uh-huh, I see that face. Okay. So, Ladies Lunch Con. I had no idea how controversial it was going to be to tweet out an event that was, you know, woman only, or all who identify as women only. Just, I had no idea. Um, and so the idea came about because myself, my friend Ivy, and my friend Stacy were at a Nova Hackers meeting. Nova Hackers are awesome. And um, we, thank you, see, we're great. Um, <laughs> I was at this Nova Hackers meeting and we thought, okay, we'll have a ladies lunch at DEF CON, all the Nova Hackers ladies. And you just can't stay small. So then it was like, okay, 
any, you know, all ladies at DerbyCon. So we tweeted it out and it ended up being 13 women. And it was super cool because there's not many opportunities for women in tech to get together like that because there's just not as many of us. So it was like for some women, it was the first time ever they'd been in a group of women who spoke their language. My friend Allison Nixon had never had that experience before. And it was amazing. <laughs> I was tearing up a little bit because it was just like, it was honestly kind of magic. And like we were, we were having a good time. It's kind of like the corollary is all the guys getting together and having a good time. Um, and so it was like, it's, it was great. It needed to happen, and we decided to do it again, because, you know, once is never enough. Um, so we did it at SkyDogCon, we did it at B-Sides DC. We're doing it tomorrow. All who identify as ladies are welcome. If you're feeling left out, Nova Hackers is doing like a guy's lunch thing, which is actually open to everyone, um, if you'd like to join them. Um, and so, you know, it, it seemed great. We decided to start doing some local events because people got bored of, well, not bored, but it was a long time between B-Size DC and ShmooCon. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't enough, so we decided to do some additional events, we got requests. And so one of the things, you know, since we were getting so much flack, it's like, oh wait, this is, we need to do some more research and find out why we're getting such pushback, um, is, you know, the ratio of women to men in tech is not balanced. It's, you know, there's much more, many more men than there are women. And so to quantify that, there are a bunch of different statistics. Um, it's hard to get good statistics because everything is skewed. So the 25% that is the Department of Labor, you know, it includes women who work for computing companies who actually don't work with computing types of tasks like receptionists and project managers. Um, but the, the Tracy Chow's project, which is actually pretty cool, is self-reported. So you've got a bias and a skew there. Um, so, you know, I look at these numbers and I go, we can probably safely estimate about 20%, uh, which is probably on the high end, but this, you know, it's a fair number to go with. And so, why do we need more women in tech? Well, for the first time, for the first use case, um, we, we need more women in tech because when men start talking about their feelings, they are ridiculed and put down, okay? We have a high degree of burnout. We need to be able to talk more about our stresses and our anxieties and, oh my God, I've been playing defense, it's 365 a year and I will never win, ever, ever. You know, we need to be able to have those conversations. And you can see the evidence of that with the InfoSec Burnout Project. You know, we've also had a high degree of suicide rate. You know, it's, it's very important that we move in that direction. And, you know, because nerds like statistics and math and everything. Um, this is something called the Peachy Multiplier. So it's... It's a model of women and men making sexist remarks to each other. People making sexist remarks to each other. And so the, the, the research shows that 20% of either gender is sexist or will make sexist remarks to each other. So 20% of women and 20% of men. So the first thing is, we're equally sexist, all right? It's not that men are more sexist. Um, but when you have population disparity, you have some really, you know, some, some tough situations, which is, this is a 50-person population, okay? So 10 are female dots and 40 are male dots. Um, so you've got 20% of each of those. And in that population, the, unluck the unluckiest man in that population, based on the ratio, gets three remarks, sexist remarks. The luckiest man gets none, but actually most men don't experience them just because of the ratio, not because people are different. Unfortunately, because of the ratio, the, unluckiest, the, the luckiest woman gets three, and the unluckiest woman gets nine. You know, it's, it's bad math, and we can change that and, and fix a whole bunch of other societal problems, too, by bringing the ratios of males to females closer together because it fixes this and it fixes a bunch of other social problems at the same time. And <laughs> this slide's fun. Hmm? Thank you. Love you. Um, so if we don't choose to proactively fix this, well, it's going to be shoved down our throats because if you look around, um, the prevalence of code of conduct stuff is getting higher. I uh, looked at a particular wiki, the Ada Initiatives Wiki, and there were a hundred conventions that had adopted codes of conduct. And 84 of those, uh, yes, I think so, 86 had adopted codes of conduct based on the Ada Initiatives sample code of conduct. My problem with that sample code of conduct is that there's way too many ways to go wrong. You know, so it's gender, gender identity, uh, body, race, disability, physical appearance. I don't like your beard. I love you to bits. 
Just saying. No, I don't. I actually have a problem with your beard. But there's so many different ways to go wrong. And we're nerds. And socially awkward is not new to us. Um, you know, like, so that's a problem. And a great example of that is the, the Adria Richards dongle gate situation. Because dongle, just saying dongle, dongle, right? Dongle. <laughs> dongle, right? So the, the situation was is that two gentlemen were sitting behind Adria and they were making dongle jokes. Okay, it's a funny word, I'm just saying. And so that and some other comments about forking, just saying. Um, and she got offended. And instead of saying, hey guys, come on, cut it out, right? Or getting up and leaving the room or walking away or you know, in any way engaging in a nonviolent cooperative solution communication, she tweeted a picture of them <laughs> and complained to the organizers and um, cited this code of conduct as the reason you know, it was acceptable for her to behave in this way. And she got the guy fired, or one of the guys fired, and um, the internet's reaction was not positive. Uh, the Chans don't like that, apparently. And so she got DDoSed, or her company got DDoSed, and then she got fired, all right? So that's one reason I really hate it. The other reason is besides San Francisco 2013, I was not there. I have not spoken to any organizers about it. I only know what I've seen on blogs. So this is you know, what I understand. Um, that from what I can see, an individual contacted the organizers saying that the talk you know, was sexual in nature and that it was inappropriate for the subjects to be around women because it might you know, make women feel bad or make it unsafe for women. Um, Banshee may kill me. And um, <laughs> so that's not cool for many different reasons because what ended up happening is, you know, things happen, things happen very quickly, and the talk ended up getting pulled. And it was a great talk. It had been done at a different B-Sides. You know, it wasn't that B-Sides San Francisco didn't want the talk. You know, it was a great talk. It was a recognized presenter. And, you know, I think that we're all sexual beings. I think that we have to recognize that. And trying to regulate how we communicate in that way um, doesn't work so well. So, thank you. And so, my problem with this policy is not that I want or think it's okay for people to harass other people. My problem with this policy is that it allows, you know, anyone in an organization that has this policy to say, I don't like this overheard conversation and, you know, react, get them punished, up to getting ba uh, blackballed and in this community, all you have is your reputation. When your reputation goes bad, find a new job or find a new community, you know, depending on how bad you get. And so I'm not okay with that because it's just based on a perception. There's so many different ways to go wrong. I'm also not okay with one person being able to control the conversation because that's not what we're like, right? We're hackers, right? And so that's my other major problem with it. Um, idea is a great idea, but no, the implementation is bad. And so what does it cause? Men are more afraid of being around women in tech than ever. Um, the conferences that have this, guys are like walking on eggshells, or they don't go at all. And it's unacceptable to me, but I don't speak for them. It's also, if you express an opinion that these codes of conduct are wrong, well then you're deemed as part of the reason you need a code of conduct. That's not cool either. And so I want to offer you what, if you have to have a code of conduct, something I find acceptable or comfortable, which is that the furries have some really good ideas. <laughs> I know, they're great. Love me some furries. <laughs> Okay, so Anthrocon is a furry convention that's like 5,500 people in Pennsylvania. And they have had two complaints or two issues, as far as I can tell, on the internet ever. One was outside of the building, so not where security was. And the other was reported uh, a rape that was reported via social media, but not to the conference organizers or the police. 
Okay, so that says something there about, you know, the event. I'm not ever trivializing rape, it's a horrible experience, but that, that's, that's one report in forever. Okay, they do a great job, and there's 5,500 people, and the furries totally, like, have a blast. They are, they drink, and they go and look at presentations on sex, and they buy adult, you know, furry drawings, and they do all of the things that are awesome, and they don't have problems. <laughs> so, and so the reason they don't have problems, I reached out to Uncle Cage, who is the chairperson over at Anthrocon, because if I'm going to suggest something, I want to make sure I can stand behind it. And they don't have problems because the security staff is very present and they are members of the community, so they're always moving around um, because it's a tight-knit community and nobody wants to mess up a good time. And because if you mess up, <laughs> you know, bad enough that you get the chairperson's ire and they rule, he rules, you're out, you're banned, goodbye. And so because of that, they don't have problems. And I love that tone. I think that there's, there's certain parts I really like, and the first part is the golden rule, which is basically, that's the policy, and everything else in that document was added because someone did something, so you had to make sure there was a statement for it. But hackers do really well, and I think people do really well with minimum rules on what they can't do, instead of, you know, like, expect us to be adults, right? Have a high-level policy statement, and if you're a jerk, go by. Okay, then we have to add a line of policy. But don't over-regulate us because then people start trying to find ways to, to bend the rules or break the rules or rebel against the rules. Um, and if you look at some of the stuff at CCC, um, there was um, someone did creeper cards and people did not take that very well. You know, you can't regulate us, we just get very cranky. And so, okay, so we have an idea of what the problem is. We have something that's less distasteful and is in line with who we are if you need something. I am not a code of conduct consultant, so I will not be following that road. And then you go, okay, so why aren't there more women in technology? Because, you know, it's obvious we kind of need more women in tech. They're awesome. I love other women. I think it's cool. They're awesome. It's nice to have women around. I love having men around too, so don't feel left out. Um, and the reasons are women don't get into tech because they don't think it's fun. Don't think they, they, can, they don't think they can do it, or they don't think they'll be working with people they like. And those are perceptions that can be changed. And so I've got together, you know, my, my friends Stacy and I have co-founded um, a, a, a project to bring more women into technology um, and to balance the gender divide, because as soon as we can do that, I can pick a new project. Um, but I'm really kind of like, we need to do this as a community. There are just so many good reasons. Um, if the advisory board, so to speak, is we have immediately brought in people to have strong listen to opinions. Um, Conrad is a guy, and Trish is transgender, because we know these are really, 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 really important things to have involved in any, or people, or gender types, or help me out here, but the, to have in any conversation about gender. Okay, so that was really important to us. And so what we're looking to do is to create bridge environments. So, hi, you're a person going to a boys and girls school, girls club, or you're a high school student, or you're a community college student, or a college student, or just someone I met at work, or you know, anyone who's interested in tech or might be interested in tech, create opportunities for women who are interested to interact with each other without getting picked on by each other, because we can be incredibly cruel to each other. You know, and it's, it's bad. Um, and we're cruel to each other because partly we're, you know, we're, we're taught that we have to compete with each other for resources instead of we have to compete with everyone for resources. And it creates a really negative vibe and a lot of backstabbing and heartache. And so it's got to change. You know, we have to create safe ways for women to interact with each other positively. Um, so creating peer groups, your, your peers are who you are. You put yourself in a group of people who are better than you, who are positive, wonderful people, and you become better. I have firsthand experienced that in my own life. And so creating ways for women to peer with each other, um, creating you know, women's only and open invite educational opportunities, because you don't have to like it, but you do need women's only educational environments because some women will not raise their hand otherwise. And it's sad and it's heartbreaking 
that we have to do it, but it has to be done because like, you sit them in a class and you watch them and they don't do anything, they don't raise their hand, and then you put them in a class where it's all women and they start doing this, and it's, it's amazing. I wish we didn't need it, but it has to be done. You know, otherwise women won't speak up. Some women, some women are just like, whatever. Hi, this is a microphone. But it takes a little bit to get from, I'm a little shy and you know, just got to 2600, to hi, this is a microphone. And so it's, it's a way to bring more women into the community. Um, and also bringing women, men and women into contact with each other, because we're socially awkward nerds. And so, <laughs> you know, we have to give men and women a way to interact as sexual human beings without being afraid that they'll say something wrong and they'll get blackballed out of the community. Okay, thank you. And so that's the project I'm looking to, to meet people who want to be involved, both you know, women and men, you know, because it's a great idea. You know, I think it's an idea that'll change things. And you know, it's something you know, looking to start small. We're doing some things here. We you know, just start, build a community, grow it over time. So it's, don't expect it to explode overnight, but I really do feel like providing these opportunities and providing a model for other organizations to provide this, these opportunities is going to make a difference. And things we can all do right now, when you meet someone, don't assume they're like anything. Just be open, because as a woman, people will judge me as, uh, you're not tech, right? Oh, yes, I am, and probably more than you. But, <laughs> the, you know, be open. Um, when people come into your community and they're new, RTFM is a pretty nasty thing to do to someone who's trying to learn. And that's been the way we've been. We're changing rapidly. But just, you know, hey, you're new. Let's teach you some stuff or show you things. Um, and in summary and conclusion, Bringing more women into tech helps everyone, not just women, but the entire community. It brings cultural diversity, brings friendships, we learn to interact with each other. We all have a better time, and if we don't address this proactively, we're going to have the code of conduct people marching down our door and trying to push it in our throats, which has happened, and I'd really rather not experience. So, thank you. absolutely agree that I want more smart people in the industry because we need more smart people in the industry, right? You know, more smart minds changing problems. And I also want to say that we need it because we need more viewpoints. Diversity of viewpoints is a beautiful thing. When you have companies that have a more diverse workforce, they're smarter and more successful. And I firmly believe that we need that diversity in the community. And I think that that's awesome, and so we'll do a little bit of baking, and then we'll throw them in the pool, and they will learn to deal, okay? And absolutely, if you don't want to play with us, or you don't think what we're doing is valuable, then don't. You know, this is what I see is needed. You don't have to agree with me. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Okay. So just a final reminder, 6.15 tomorrow, I should have more goodies to throw out to people tomorrow night, so be sure to come. Thanks.